Hi everyone, Annabelle Lusardi here, FLA coach and coordinator of support services for the Mid-Atlantic Foundation. Welcome to today's challenge. I have a question for you today. If your church ceased to exist tomorrow, would anyone out in your community notice? It's an important question, isn't it? We have this mission to make disciples for the transformation of the world. But no matter what our context, whether we're a large church or a small church, if we're urban or suburban or rural, if we're not making connections with the folks out in our communities, we're missing the opportunity to spread the gospel and make disciples. So how do we do it? How do we get to know the people out in our community? It's all about relationships, isn't it? There are so many different organizations probably that are happening, that are doing things out in your community. How can you get to know them? I would suggest just start looking. Can you make connections with your schools? Can you make connections with the fire department and police department? Can you make connections with the library? Can you make connections with your Girl Scouts and Boy Scouts in the area, with your youth recreation um, sports programs, with the Lions Club, with the YMCA, with any number of things that are going on out in your community? How can you get to know those people and ask them, how can we help you? One of the things my church did is um, we have a ministerium where we um, do things together with um, some of the other denominations in our community. And for several years, we did an annual prayer walk for the schools. We walked from the elementary school to the middle school to the high school before school started at the end of the summer when the teachers were in school ahead of time before the students doing their planning work. And we would walk and we would pray at each of the schools for everybody involved with the schools, the students, the teachers, the faculty, the bus drivers, the custodians, everyone. Um, and then we would send homemade cookies into the teachers while they were doing their planning time and just say, we're here, we're thinking about you, we're praying for you for a wonderful school year and let us know if there's anything we can do for you. It was a super way to make connections with, um, with those schools. Um, for many of the families, who, some of the families were already attending our churches, um, and of course many were not, but it was a super way to start building that relationship. Um, I know there are many churches where the pastor is the chaplain for their local fire department. Maybe that's something you could look into. Um, there's so many things going on out in your communities. How can the church make themselves available to those organizations and just say, what can we do for you? One thing that happened in my church, I'd like to share this story. Actually, two stories. The first story is a negative story that I'm gonna, that I'm gonna share, again, from England, and I don't wanna beat on England, but this happened at my father's church. Um, he attends a small church in a small village, not the one that I grew up in, but um, a similar sort of setting very elderly congregation that is dwindling. Um, there's no two ways about it. It is probably what we would call a dying church. But my father is still very involved and still very passionate about the gospel. Um, and he noticed that on Sunday mornings as they came out from church and stood in the parking lot and said their goodbyes before going home for their Sunday lunch, that although there were very few families, if any, actually in worship with them, across the street on the village green, there were th throngs of families with um, young children all doing their Sunday sports, soccer and um, rugby, it would be over there and possibly cricket. Um, but they were all across the street doing sports, none of them in church. So my father had this great idea and he thought, wouldn't it be nice if one or two of the people from the congregation, once or twice a month, we went across and introduced ourselves to folks and maybe handed out some free cookies or some water bottles, juice boxes, something like that, um, just to say, hi, we're here and um, this is who we are. He brought that up at a church council meeting, absolutely shot down. Everybody said, nope, we're not gonna do that. If they want to come to church, they need to come into the church. We're not, we don't have the time to worry about that. And my father was so discouraged by that. And I think it's just a sad story because I think that is a church that is not going to thrive once this generation has moved on. Contrast that with, I think, what so many of you are doing. Um, so many of you are connecting with your communities and are doing wonderful things. So I would just encourage you to continue and share this story from my church that um, has just been a really wonderful testimony to what can happen when a community comes together. 
We have a very active prayer blanket ministry that has been in place for many years um, with a wonderful group of people who do knitting and crocheting and um, tying those fleece blankets that you can make those beautiful big fleece blankets so that anybody who is being prayed for, um, for illness or for mourning or for whatever reason um, will receive a prayer blanket. It's been a truly wonderful ministry for many, many years. And a couple of years ago, our pastor brought a prayer blanket to um, a patient who was in the hospital. And this person happened to be a veteran and was super grateful for receiving the blanket. And when the pastor was there, it coincided with a visit from the hospital chaplain, who himself happens to be a veteran. And in talking with the pastor, he um, mentioned that many, many veterans are treated at our local hospital. And for many of them, they have very little in the way of a support system. So this got the wheels turning, and um, when the pastor came back to the prayer blanket team, she said, they, they said, well, maybe we can do something about that. So they decided to set a goal of making 100 blankets to send to the hospital to be given to veterans when they were um, admitted as patients. And I, this was sometime in the summer, and they decided 100 blankets by Veterans Day, by November 11th. And they put word out to the congregation. They bought lots of those fleece blanket kits so that people who didn't know how to knit or crochet, which would be me, um, could learn how to tie the knots and to make those fleece blankets. And the congregation rose to the occasion and a hundred blankets were, um, were made and were delivered to the hospital. The hospital chaplain was so grateful, he asked if he could come and thank the congregation in person, which he did, actually during one of our Impact of Your Generosity moments. Um, and when he did, he shared with the congregation that those blankets had been very gratefully received, but he also shared that they were almost all gone. So many people had come through the hospital who were veterans who um, were in need of a little extra comfort that he had already given out most of them. So that set the challenge that for the following year, which was actually calendar year 2019 for us, we set a goal to make 1,111 blankets by Veterans Day, November 11th. Um, well, we're, we're a decent sized church, but that was a big ask for our congregation and we knew that we couldn't do it alone. So the word went out into the community. We asked our ministerium church partners, other churches in the, in the area. We talked to Girl Scout groups. We talked to the schools. We talked to the Lions Club and the Rotary and all those different organizations. We just put the word out there. We are making blankets to give to veterans in the hospital. And boy, did the community step up. Blankets came pouring in. Um, we became very well known at the local Joanne store because they routinely sold out of fleece because we were um, making so many blankets. And actually, funnily enough, that year, that Joanne store was going through a major renovation. And when they had their grand reopening, they wanted to showcase their center crafts area, which they had built for um, group projects and things. And they asked the Project 1111 group um, to come in and be the showcase craft for the grand reopening. So we got some wonderful press about that, which generated more blankets being made. I'm not sure if we got to our 1111 goal. That really wasn't the point. The point was to get as many people involved as possible and as many blankets made as possible. And that has become kind of an identity for our church, that we were the church that started this blanket program that has blessed so many veterans in our hospital. That's just one example. One thing that we have done out in the community. Um, what can you do? You know your setting. So here's my challenge for you today. After this, um, after you've watched this video and heard that little music, which incidentally I now hear in my sleep um, at the end, sit down for a few minutes and brainstorm. Who is out there who you have yet to meet? Who is out there that you can make connections with, that you can make partnerships with? Um, think big, dream big. List it all. What, would, what could you do out in your community? And once you've got that list, look at it realistically and say, where can I start today? What move can I make to get to know somebody out in the community? And who can I ask from my team to help me make those connections? So that's my challenge to you. Best of luck, and we will be seeing you soon.